When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, a man whose glasses are as lame as his jokes, he is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. No matter how lame your glasses are, it's good to be seen. Tonight, we are drinking Lil Devil by Ale Smith Brewing Company in beautiful San Diego, California. Garage grade Santiago out of five bottle caps. Lil Devil is a pale ale, golden color with clean malt flavors and a hint of tangy hop tones. And this fabulous brew was brought to us by this fabulous crew. First, we have Isabel in Austin, Texas. Also in Austin, Texas, we have Rachel. Mm. She says, try some live oak from right here in Austin. Next, we go to Silverwood, Wood, Michigan, and say hello and thank you to Lorna. And we also have Mary Bell from Phoenix, Arizona. Julie, who says, cheers from Las Vegas, and she will see us on Snapchat. We like your gym. And last but not least, we have Kristen from New Orleans. She's on Untapped as well. And of course, she's recommending some New Orleans beers for us. Looks like it's all ladies helping us with the beer fun today, Captain. It's ladies' night in the garage. Quick, Captain, (laughs) fill the CD changer with some ABBA and TLC. Well, you really know what makes the women go crazy. So thank you to Isabel, Rachel, Lorna, Mary Bell, Julie, and Kristen. And if you would like to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And we fix the stuff with PayPal, so it shouldn't be an issue for anybody. And we're also a little behind... So we only try to do a handful of these uh, episodes. So if we haven't got to you, be patient. We appreciate the support. Go to truecrimegarage.com and make sure that you sign up on our mailing list. And that is enough of the business. That's right. Gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer, and let's talk some true crime. And we are back with the second part of the Mitrice Richardson case. Yeah, so a quick recap. We got a 24-year-old. She's arrested on Wednesday night. She is put in jail. She's there for a couple hours. They release her. And then maybe, you know, there's possible sighting of her maybe as a prowler in somebody's yard. Um, So she's been missing for several days. They've done several searches. Mm -hmm. Big Uh, scale searches. Right. The family is basically at a loss. We We have a bunch of areas a bunch of red flags going up we got a lot of fumbling around by the sheriff's department and law enforcement and and all these are we're getting less answers and more mm-hmm. questions at this point in the case and pretty much the standpoint by the two parties involved in this we have the sheriff's department who they're kind of saying that they believe she probably just took off um mm-hmm. and what the family is saying is no we don't believe she took off 
mother's intuition is that somebody picked her up. You guys let her go in the middle of the night in the dark. Yeah. She was in an unfamiliar area. She probably got picked up by somebody, got mm-hmm. in a car, and that's why we. it's been months and we've not seen her. And where we left off was several months after the case and after the investigation and the searches mm-hmm. have gone on, the family has begged the sheriff's department for the release of surveillance footage inside the jail from that evening when she was picked up and they're claiming there was no tape. And then all of a sudden there is a tape. Amazing. It just, it just appears out of nowhere. Well, not out of nowhere. It's in the captain's desk the entire time. Look, magic. It's magic. Well, then some, some other magical items happen that (laughs) it takes, it takes three months for them to decide to show the video to the family. The family Mm -hmm. thinks that the video has been doctored. Um, and it's, they have some good points. Now we've not seen the video. I I don't believe that that Uh, it's available to the public. Well, I've seen clips of it. You've seen clips, but I've only seen the clips where, um, I believe it was on disappeared. So if you're looking for something cool to watch, I know disappeared, they have all their episodes on Hulu. Mm -hmm. That might be something that would be interesting to check out, but they do show some clips, but it's just of her in the jail cell. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, and again, I don't know what her baseline is, so I can't tell you if her actions are, are weird or not. I know that, um, like we talked about, that she was a go-go dancer, but she also had a, a background in actual dance. And so, you know, maybe she's just kind of a restless person. And so I don't know. The family said it was a little odd, but the thing that the family is starting to stick to is as she's leaving the station, she turns right, I believe, uh, out out of the station and a little bit after um, her leaving mm-hmm. a, a deputy leaves he leaves from a from another door close by and he leaves about two minutes after she leaves the building right and basically okay so let's view, let's look at it from the viewpoint of the family mm-hmm. every turn it seems like the the law enforcement is not on your side it seems like they're hiding stuff. So then you start becoming very weary of, one, their competency, how much they actually care, or were they involved? Right. And so when they see this and they know that, you know, it took you months and months and months to tell us that you even had a tape. And then once you had a tape, it took you months and months and months for us to see the tape. Now that we see it, you've told us several times that there was no deputies on duty at the jail. And now we see one in the footage. So are you trying to cover up for this guy? So we have this we have this deputy. Now they don't want to release his name, but what they did find out was this deb- deputy was just there dropping off a, a, a person in custody mm-hmm. and then was going back out in the route. They had a partner that day. That, then, uh, that deputy and his partner then make a citation for speeding or something within 45 minutes. Now, again, a big red flag but it comes down to if you believe that my trees was the prowler in quotation marks, then does, does it matter that there was a deputy seen leaving roughly with her? Well, but you know, this is a situation where the, the sheriff's department is called out again for, you know, to do a drive by for this person that might be trespassing on the property. That could be my trees. Mm-hmm. Um, it's strange too, that, you know, shortly after she was released, there is a, a shift change, um, according to her parents, uh, that there was a shift change that would have taken place. Um, I, I don't know what that means, uh, because if she was the prowler, then she somehow made a trip, uh, six miles to this home. Mm-hmm. And we can't figure out if that was on foot or if somebody picked her up and dropped her off out in the middle of nowhere. Right. And the, and what the sheriff's uh, department is saying is they believe that she was just wandering on foot. Mm-hmm. This is what the, and again, it goes back to was she calling a friend or was she just talking to herself on the phone? Who knows? But it seems like she left on foot. So the, the sheriff's department is saying she got here. She was the prowler. Not like she was, you know, causing any disturbance, but she was on somebody's property. They believe by foot. Now, the family thinks, no, no way in hell. She was drove there. Now, who drove her there? Was it a police officer? I look. I don't know if it matters if she drove there or she got there by foot. It, it all it starts to matter is do you believe that's her? Mm-hmm. And and that's the that's the question. Now the one thing that I thought was interesting is during some of these searches they did like drone searches and they did like f- foot searches and they did I think one of the largest searches in like California history or or that county's history. But uh, one of the things that the father brings up 
constantly um his name is, is Michael 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 Richardson um loved him in Seinfeld um one of the things that he brings up is when they started a search they know by the videotape that she leaves to the right well when they started the search they left the building and started the search to the left well and then you have the the scent dogs that that leave Bill Smith's home mm-hmm. where she was seen possibly trespassing and they they follow the tracks and follow her scent for a bit, but they get lost in horse tracks. Mm-hmm. So I think one thing that the parents had brought up here, and, and I, I mentioned a shift change. Now, I'm a bit unclear of if that shift change took place right around the same time that she was leaving or if they're talking about a shift change that would have taken place shortly after the time she was seen possibly trespassing on Bill Smith's property. Because one question that they have brought up to law enforcement was that if somebody from your department was involved, now they would have had as as far as some somebody with evil intent, mm-hmm. they have a lead because the, the lead would be they know there's this woman that's out on her own, wandering around in the dark with no means of transportation, no money, no cell phone. And was she possibly picked up by somebody that would have known that she was in that situation, placed somewhere near this Bill Smith's home where she was later seen so that she could be picked up again later once that person was off work or or did not need to be accounted for. Um, The thought here is, though, that Bill Smith's home, we're not talking about like a regular neighborhood. This is Mm -hmm. near uh, like trails and hills and things like that where people go on horseback to go venturing out. Yeah, hiking or running. Now, what's happening here is there's probably some of you uh, as our nasally drones or, you know, boxing your your eardrums you're thinking oh my god cop conspiracy right i mean this is like making a murderer right which we ever a lot of people jump look there's somebody going i never bought the 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 cop conspiracy and making a murderer but some people did right uh i don't buy that in that case but that's for a different day and but then there's some of you listening going no way cops can Cop conspiracy, not happening, right? Don't buy it. Well, I was just reading a report the other day, and and normally I never jump on the cop conspiracy bandwagon, but I was reading this report where this police officer was spending six months in jail, which is not enough time for this crime that he did, but there was a car accident. The cop goes up you know, to take the report, ends up raping the person in the, in the car accident, now he only serves six months in jail. He's he should serve the rest of his life in fucking jail, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but this stuff does happen. So when when you hear reports like this, it's not crazy with all these things going on that the 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 parents are championing, going, "Hey, look, there's something not right here," and mm-hmm. it's either that you're fumbling douchebags or you had something to do with it. Now I'm I'm with you. I I seldom believe in a in a police officer being the perpetrator of horrible crimes. But we all know it does happen on occasion. When my where my mind starts to wander in this case is let's let me think about this for a second. Okay, I want right. to I want to this is this kind of the path that I went down when I was thinking. Would are a, you going to like take five minutes and go in the corner? Would a think, sheriff just, have yeah. been involved? One of these mm-hmm. would have a deputy have been involved? Would it you know somebody that that knew she was being released, that could Mm -hmm. pick her up later, offer her to drive her to her car. I mean, that's the perfect ruse to get her in your vehicle. Because, hey, I know where your car is impounded, and I have the ability to get you your car back. Why don't you give me a, I'll give you a ride. And not only that, I'm not some stranger that's out driving around in the dark. I'm the police. And Well, and and my thought, too, is that you have officers, when they pick up this beautiful girl, young, 24, and what was the joke that we think that she made when they said, you need to pay your bill? And she says, I don't have any money, but how about, you know, I pay you in sex, which we, we believe is a joke. We, we believe that's that her she, joking, correct. That, that was, she was serious by that. But there's this joke, and so then there's these rumors. Then they take the girl to the jailhouse. Then the cops are talking. Then people on their radio are talking, and they go, oh, and, and I guarantee you, because guys, you know, look, I'm all for, I'm a dude's dude, right? I'm a dude's dude, man's dude, whatever. When it comes down to it, there's a lot of creepy dudes. And so how many cops are going, hey, did you see that hot chick? You know, did you see that hot chick that we picked up? She's a little nuts. She she offered sex to, to the, the manager. To the manager. Yeah. 
you know, so then somebody sees her leaving and goes, hey, well, if she offered the manager sex, maybe I pick her up, take her to her car. Maybe she offers me sex. You're exactly right. You took the words out of my mouth. If, mm-hmm. if she was willing to offer that to the manager, what would she give me in trade for a, for a ride or for right. me helping her out? And then guess what? She's not she's not heterosexual. She's she's a lesbian. Right. But they don't. They no, don't no know I know. That. I know that. But right. what I'm saying, that would be less likely that she was going to offer sex for a, right. a, a, a stupid little, you know, favor. Right, right, right. Um, and, you know, that could have turned sinister at some point. It could have turned bad uh, in that situation. And I don't want to sound, I don't know how to make this not sound weird, but she was, Get she, weird, dude. she was very attractive. Now, mm-hmm. do I believe that attractive women she didn't like your team though? Right. But do I believe that more, that the attractive women are more likely to, become a victim. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, I don't know in every situation, but I would say one that is wandering out in the dark or wandering around by herself might be more likely to be picked up. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's the, that's the concern the family has. Right. And well, the other thing too, is that when they talk about her personality, okay. So her personality, the, the first thing is the sheriff say, well, maybe she got on a bus. Well, First of all, her mother says she's never rode on a bus. She's never taken a city bus anywhere in her life. She yeah. wouldn't even know how to do that. So we don't think she got on a bus. And second of all, she says, my Therese is not an outdoor person. She does not like bugs. She does not like the dirt. She does mm-hmm. not like the elements. She is not one to just have taken off and wandered out into the middle of nowhere and went hiking all of a sudden in the dark. And then again, that morning after she's seen. Well, and I, I think the issue with that is they know they know their daughter when she's mentally stable. Mm-hmm. I think the the question in here is you don't know what if somebody is going through a mental illness, if she's dealing with um, manic episodes or hypermanic or any type of episodes like that, you don't know how that person is going to react. So you have and you know if this was her first episode that they know of of her being manic then they have no way to judge how she would react why she's manic. And that's when they really start talking about and going through the things that she did that day and the events that may have led up to her going to that restaurant. Mm -hmm. So her mother and her, her aunt were both saying that the reason why we think that she was having mental issues was that she, she had been sending us some strange text that day. Mm-hmm. To which they were both responding, you know, how can I help you? Could, do you need to talk to somebody? And now, mind you, this is this is hindsight, right? Right. right. And but that's their proof to the sheriff's department that we got to be worried about her state of mind. We think she went nuts, so mm-hmm. and she was out wandering around in the middle of nowhere, and somebody took advantage of that. So some of the things that had happened that day, she, like I said, she had worked in a secretarial type position at this shipping company. Mm -hmm. So she did work there that morning. Uh, She went and she took a lunch break. Now, remember she had said to somebody at some point that day that she was watching a soap opera and God had instructed her to take the afternoon off. So she did not return to work that day. Mm -hmm. Uh, Meanwhile, her mom and her aunt are receiving these strange texts. And at the same time, we said that she was a go-go dancer and she went by the name Hazel. Well, she had business cards that she had printed up uh, Mm -hmm. with her dancer name on on these business cards. Her aunt had found a whole bunch of these business cards laying all over the front porch of of her home with a written note on her car, which made absolutely no sense. I I read it and I thought of trying to include portions of that note, but it made so it made no sense at all to even Mm -hmm. try to, to try to pick through it. Um, So after working a half day, leaving for lunch, she does go to the great grandmother's house at some point, and then she does leave and she does not return. It's believed at that time is when she went off driving, ended up in Malibu, and ended up at the at Joffrey's restaurant. Well, I mean, the again, the whole uh, I was watching a soap opera, and it and it told God told me through the soap opera, like uh, that's like is it, again is that just a joke? Is that just, is that a joke or is that for real? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like she, she made the joke of, well, I'll just pay for, you know, what about a sexual favor to pay off this bill? You know, was she just making some absurd jokes? Right. Well, after several large scale searches, like we had talked about, 
Early in 2010, my Teresa's father, Michael Richardson, was hanging out in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. He is riding in the back of a vehicle when he spotted my Teresa, who he said looked as if she was working the streets. Now, Michael got out of the vehicle, so and he wanted to run up to her. Right. So, But before he could tell the driver to stop and he could get out of the vehicle and run up to her, he lost sight of her. So he's like in a taxi or, or an Uber or something. Yes. And where we say he saw my trees, mind you, he believes that he saw mm-hmm. my trees. And he lose sight of her and he does not see her for the remainder of her trip. Well, this, his is, trip, I'm this is really confusing to me because on one point, it's like you go with the idea that this is a grieving father. He loved his daughter. He wants her to be safe. He's in Vegas. He thinks he, you know, um, he thinks he sees his daughter. So, so that part I go, he's grieving. He's just making this up in his head. But when he says, well, she, but she was a prostitute. That, right. that, that she looked like she was working the street because as the, as a father, you don't want to say, well, my daughter, it was working the street. So that makes me almost believe his, his sighting more. Right. But I, the grieving part, you know, so, but because of this sighting, now we're going to start getting a bunch of more sightings of Matrice and, um, in Las Vegas. Yeah. And he said where his head was at was that he thought maybe somebody that this was not her character, that he thought that this was something that maybe somebody had taken her captive that night and taken her to Las Vegas and put her to work, so to speak. Um, in June of 2010, the same year, a high school friend of my Teresa's reported having seen her in a Vegas casino. Mm-hmm. Uh, Las Vegas PD said that during this time, uh, over the course of several months, they had received about 70 such reports of my Teresa sightings in Las Vegas. Again, a lot of the times is that this case started becoming uh, publicized and, and, and good for the case. I mean, any time that you can talk about a case and get the word out, and I think that had a lot to do with the family. I also believe that had a lot to do with the, the, the father was very ad, adamant, and he was uh, anybody that was going to talk to him, he'd talk to you about it. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes he'd say some goofy shit when he was being interviewed. Um, like there's one interview where he keeps on reiterating that, you know, he, he is a black father, but he's involved in his child's life, even though she's missing, he's involved in the child's life. I don't know if he was an absentee you know, parent before this or not, but what I do know is anybody that was giving him a microphone to talk, he, he talked. So then he sees the sighting, and then we get all these other ones. And I think it, that is just people wanting to see what they want, want to see. And in most of these cases, we're talking about a face in the crowd. And we both know that if you want, if you look hard enough and you want to see a face in a crowd, you might just, you might trick yourself into believing that you did. The mm-hmm. other issue here too, I think, is we talked about Mitrice being in pageants. We mm-hmm. talked about her uh, being a go-go dancer. And there's a lot of pictures of her outside of both the pageants and working at, as a dancer. So mm-hmm. we see a lot of different uh, views, a lot yeah. of different looks of my trees. And a lot of times, if you watch videos of her on YouTube, you know, missing persons videos of her on YouTube, they'll show you five or six pictures of her at once mm-hmm. where she, she does, you know, she looks like herself in all of them, but she's done up in some and she's casual in others. And yeah. like I said, if you want to see a face in a crowd, you're probably going to see it. Yeah. And with the whole classmate thing, first he is hearing that his classmate is missing. He sees this lady. He tries to confront her and he's yelling, you know, my trees, my trees. And this girl starts acting a little crazy and a little weird and and takes off. Now, again, that could be as simple as this girl is not Matrice and you're yelling Matrice at her and she's going, who, who's this crazy asshole? And she takes off running. Or again, that could be, you know, look, if you're a go-go dancer, it doesn't matter if you're a go-go dancer. If you're a bartender, if you're a server, if you're a guy in a band at a bar, you know, bars are normally not like this hub of positive lifestyles. Oh, really? It's not like a collective group of saints <laughs> getting together to uh No, there's just some anoint bad, the sick. There's just some bad shit that can go on, and especially in that environment, it's one of those things where it's like you know, every friend, I have friends that have danced, mm-hmm. you know, men and women that have danced, uh, and gay and straight clubs. And I've had friends that have been cocktail waitresses. Even the cocktail waitresses are offered drugs. Oh, I'm sure. 
You know, so I think that's the other thing too is if she, maybe she was going to uh, Malibu to meet somebody that she met at through this, you know, dancing, and maybe maybe they did give her a ride, and if they did give her a ride, then again, I have a problem with all this stuff if you believe that she wasn't the the trespasser. You right. know what I mean? Like that she was picked up at night. And if she was picked up at night, then to me, it's probably somebody that she knew. Uh, uh, you know, somebody that she wasn't telling other people about. Maybe some shady character from the club. But if you believe that it was her trespassing, then to me, she's picked up by a stranger. Mm-hmm. You know, or unless she went into, you know, because the trail leads to the other guy's house. What if she got in the house and she remembered somebody's number? I mean, there's so many questions, you know, but I don't fully buy the the Las Vegas stuff. Well, one thing that has brought up a lot of other questions is during the summer of 2010, they're doing more searches in the area of these horse trails and out in the hills and the mountains. Mm -hmm. And they come across a mural, a large scale mural uh, depicting African-American women in sexual positions, most of them nude. Mm -hmm. um, And they believe that this could be a potential lead or it could have been done by the person responsible for her disappearance. Yeah. And this, uh, this is kind of creepy. So let's get into this after a quick beer break. This show is sponsored by better help. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it, but adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash garage. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. You can live out your MasterChef dreams. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside, repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. All right, we're back. Cheers, everybody. And when we left off, we're talking about a mural. Yes, and what this mural is, is this was found by searchers who were out looking for Mitrice Richardson. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the summer of 2010. Now, this search was highly publicized. Um, Everybody knew that this was going to happen. It's about over 100 people were out looking for her. And it's mostly hikers and cyclists that were out looking for her. Mm -hmm. And what is discovered in this area, it's a concrete culvert, which is off of a road. Um, you know, and you have the drainage pipes, the large drainage pipes that you see near coming out of the culvert. It's mm-hmm. basically a large concrete wall. And somebody had painted uh, what is described as a racist mural. Um, it depicts many African-American women that are nude and they're some of them are in sexually explicit positions. Mm-hmm. Um, and it even seems to show a couple of uh, white faces looking on or looking at the women You have women that are tied up, uh, one that is in a wheelchair, Uh uh, some that are on, you know, on their knees. Um, I don't know how much we can describe this without boring the listeners because without looking at it, it's, it's tough to, uh, I'll post that on Instagram. So if you want to check that out, you know, go to our Instagram at true crime garage. 
Uh, what's also interesting about this is that some of the the ladies are not they're outlined. Most of the ladies are outlined in black, mm-hmm. right? And uh, but some of the ladies are outlined in blue, kind of like a ghostly blue. Yeah, I, I thought the same thing. And there's one that's in a sexual position, and one of the things that makes people say that this is a a mural that is also depicting. Uh, my my trees and then possibly other victims is because one of the girls that is outlined in blue, uh, some people think that means that those victims are dead uh, on this girl's butt uh, is a L.A. symbol. And everybody knew that, you know, Richardson was from L.A. Yeah. And this this is a large mural, though. I mean, it's it's, mm-hmm. it's pretty darn big and it would have taken somebody quite a bit of time to to paint this thing. Yeah. Um, now they find along with this mural, they find paint brushes and paint can lids at the same location. And the paint on these items had not yet dried. Yeah. So it's almost like somebody, either they happened to do it in the area that they were going to be searching just before, mm-hmm. or they did it on purpose. Yeah. Uh, which is creepy. The problem here too is, you know, like, like we said, it's, it's African American women. And I believe there's one part on, on the concrete on the ground. That's kind of leading into the area. The, there's a walkway where somebody had painted something like welcome to Afro land or something like that. And they, yeah. they, they keep all the women are having these Afro style haircuts. This is not a heavily diverse populated area. Well, yeah, and this is actually not a well populated area. They're purposely looking for her out there because they think she could have been wandering basically out in the middle of nowhere. And it, it seems to me, like you said, it's one of those things where they the, this the search was publicized and somebody was just trying to make a point. What that point was, I don't know if it was malicious or not. You know, um, um, it. Well, here's the thing. When when you see it and you know why the people were out there searching, mm-hmm. it sends chills up your spine. It's creepy. Now, had had I not known why the searchers were out there, it may not have may not have scared me. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It, it, I mean, it kind of it's almost terrifying in a way to look at it. Um, but but knowing that my trees could be out there somewhere or could have been abducted near this point, yeah is what is absolutely terrifying about it. Is this, is this the killer coming back to taunt us and Mm -hmm. to tell us that he's got more than one victim, you know, because there's many girls, many women that are depicted on this mural. Now the, the thing here is I'm sure that it was well photographed so they could figure out who had done the quote unquote artwork or graffiti better to say. Um, but you can find pictures of it on the internet. It's, it's despicable stuff really. Uh, but they quickly painted over all of the items, uh, all of this mural. I believe it was the very next day. Mm-hmm. A lot of people thought this was going to be a significant lead. Do you know where this lead takes us? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm with you. I, you know, I can see how the family would think this would be a significant lead, uh, especially the area. Mm-hmm. Um, but what ends up happening is I'm not certain if it's weeks after they find it or maybe a couple months after they find it, but they do track down the person that is responsible or persons that mm-hmm. was, were responsible for painting this mural, um, because they had put up graffiti in other locations and it was all of the same style may have even been signed. You know, some people right. sign their graffiti, uh, there's a couple of issues here though, and some more red flags by the sheriff's department. They pick up the people and, and I don't think that they're making up that they found the, um, the person who painted this, the artist, let's call them, uh, or the criminal, whatever you want to call them. Uh, I don't believe that they're making it up because they had a statement by the person or persons, mm-hmm. uh, for why they painted it. They said that they are a graffiti artist, that this is something they do in multiple locations and their style is reminiscent of one of their favorite gra- graffiti artists. So mm-hmm. it seemed a little, and there's a little more detail to that, but it seemed a little much for something just like the sheriff's department to say, well, well we found who did it and uh, whatever. Right. The, the problem here, though, is the persons that were responsible for it, they didn't charge them with anything. They they didn't you know they didn't give them a fine they 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 simply painted over it said we know who did it they right. they don't have anything to do with the disappearance I wonder if there's some kind of law though that, that they can't uh, charge them for something 
you know, I don't know if they agreed to admit to doing it in, in trade for not being charged with right. it. We don't know the details of it because they won't tell us who did it. The problem I have here though, is that particular sheriff's department has a zero tolerance on uh policy on graffiti. Right. So you, <laughs> you know, you can't really have it, but maybe, mm-hmm. maybe finding the, the, uh, the authenticator or finding the person that painted it was more important. And so you had to waive that. I don't know. It seems strange to me. It was very, it was a very despicable display of graffiti uh, and extremely mm. distasteful knowing that they're out looking for a missing young woman. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's just weird. I mean, there's, and the thing that doesn't make a lot of sense to me is why some of the women are outlined with black and why, some of them are outlined with this like ghostly light blue. It's it's very strange. So well, not only outlined, some of them are are almost completely blue or gray, right? And and other ones are very colorful. Yeah, you know, almost alive versus dead kind of thing. Yeah, and so okay, so here here's where we're at on the case, right? So she goes to the restaurant, she doesn't pay, she gets arrested, she goes to the jail, she's released from the jail. We got searches going on. We also have some eyewitnesses thinking that maybe she got away somehow and now she's in Las Vegas and now we got all these searches continuing and now now what happens? What's next? Well, what happens is the there are remains that are found. Mm-hmm. Now, this is out in an extremely remote location. This is August 9th, 2010, right around noon, just after noon. The, uh, this is in the Santa Monica Mountains. This is deep in the dark canyon. Rangers checking on a remote area known for growing pot discovered human remains. Now, when I first heard about this, I kind of mm-hmm. I wanted to call BS on this. I was like, no. The, you want to say bullshit. Right. I wanted to, the cops found her. Uh, they, you know, I, I was looking at all these conspiracy theories. Uh, mm-hmm. But but the truth, truth of it is that this area... Well, we're not done with red flags. Law enforcement had discovered over a year ago what is suspected to be an area known or used by a Mexican cartel to grow pot. It's a grow spot. Mm-hmm. Um, when conducting a flyover the year before, law enforcement spotted marijuana plants, and of course, no persons were present. Uh, these plants were simply planted and left there to mature. But law enforcement, when they discovered it, they pulled over 1,000 marijuana plants from the site. So the rangers were going back to check on the spot to make sure that somebody hadn't returned and and used it as a grow spot again for the following year. Uh, The rangers spotted some old equipment lying around hundreds of feet of garden hoses that were used to siphon creek water into PVC lines. Of course, this would be used to water those awesome weeds that they're growing. Um, but there, there was no new plants at this time. And so they ventured on down and this is where they found the remains. Mm -hmm. They noticed a skull and under, under debris of leaves and dirt, a semi decomposed naked body. Mm -hmm. There was some hair still attached to the skull. There was some hair scattered nearby, uh, what appeared to be an earring and some kind of metallic object, were tangled in that hair that was found nearby. Um, and the, the lost Hills deputies, they are called out to the scene mm-hmm. and they arrive on the scene approximately around one thirty PM that day. And, and we have some articles of clothing as well, right? Yes. Yes. There were a, uh, th- there was a pair of jeans and a belt that was found pink belt and a bra. Mm-hmm. Correct. Um, to my knowledge, the rest of the items that they may have been looking for were missing at that time. Yeah, it's uh, and so like we know, um, Matrice was wearing jeans and a, a pink belt. So, you know, there's they need to get the coroner involved to mm-hmm. to identify these remains, uh, and then we get some kind of confusion with this as well. Well, yeah, what it, what ends up happening is before the coroner gives his or her permission for the remains to be removed, the sheriff's department decides to remove them. Well, and think about the, okay, here's the problem with, think about this family for a second. So she is uh, arrested at, at, at the, <clears throat> sorry, the restaurant. It's a long day. Um, she's arrested at the restaurant. That's not a crime scene. Cops don't make that a crime scene. Sure. Her car is impound. They don't make that a crime scene. She's released from the jail. 
They don't make that a crime scene. And then she's found, you know, there's remains found, and we think it's her. Mm -hmm. And they, again, don't make that a crime scene. Right. They take the the remains before they, they, you know, basically what happens, it's pretty simple. The sheriff says, we got, you know, we we're following protocol. We're following this this by the book. Now we're talking. They already have judgments against them. They have lawsuits against them from the family, from other families, for treating inmates wrong, for tre- treating people in the jail wrong. Uh, they got a lot of issues in this department. But here's another one, and a lot of people go, "Well, wouldn't you take this a lot more serious? Wouldn't you? You know, you have all these." People, you're under, you know, we have all this publicity for this case. You're under a a microscope. Why don't you handle this with care? So there's a miscommunication between the sheriff department and the coroner's office. And then once the coroners actually get the remains, the coroners are now vocal about this. Mm -hmm. What ends up happening is that the sheriff has a, uh, they investigate this. The coroners investigate this. And then they also have a private group investigate this. All three findings were that at the end of the day, yes, they have botched some things. Maybe they made some misjudgments about this case and about this this lady and how they've handled everything. But at the end of the day, the moving of the remains was a misunderstanding. And I don't know if I buy that. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. They claim a misunderstanding. I claim BS because here's the situation. The Lost Hill Sheriff's Department and their personnel had exclusive access to the remains for about six and a half hours. Mm -hmm. They kept the coroner's team on standby for almost four hours of that time. And without permission, which is state code, they removed the remains without without permission. So they're doing multiple things wrong here. Now, keep in mind, this is a very remote location. Like we said, these people had to be flown in via helicopter to get to the spot. Um, Their their reasoning is they can claim miscommunication, Mm -hmm. but they've also said that, you know what, Um, it was getting dark and we were getting worried that animals might come and and mess with the remains. So we decided we had to make a judgment call and we right, had to pull right. them out of there. It's just, you know, they're, they're constantly covering their ass in this case. Well, here's some other things that they failed to do. Mm-hmm. You know, mind you, they were at that scene for at least six and a half hours. Mm-hmm. What they failed to do during that time is they, they failed to collect soil samples. They did not photo document the scene. They didn't photo document the body positioning or the individual stages of recovery. Yeah. Uh, the Rangers took some pictures of the scene. So looks like we should have let the park Rangers conduct the investigation on this case. Right. I think they would have had a better job of solving it. Uh, listen, according to the Lieutenant Michael Rawson and the captain, David Smith, the deputies were given permission from the coroner staff member from, from a staff member. Mm -hmm. Right. That they may move the skull to see what was beneath the debris pile. And when they did so, because the skull was still connected to the rest of the skeleton, when they lifted the skull, the body followed intact and unearthed itself as they lifted the skull. Mm -hmm. It was later determined that five of the neck bones were not even recovered from the scene. That day, so the captain and the lieutenant's statement about the recovery—not my cap, not this captain—the the recovery of the skull, the skeleton, the recovery of the remains is not only false, but it's impossible. Right. The head, the skull was not connected. So to it's the basic, body. but it's just like the fucking tape. You know what I mean? It's like it's a blatant lie. We caught you in a blatant lie that you you have surveillance of her in jail, and then it comes out months and months later. And then it takes you months and months and months to show the family because you got to doctor it up because you're just a bunch of fucking liars. And then you say, well, well, what happened was we moved the skull and then that was connected to everything. And then and that's what happened. And then based off the coroner report, you're, you're a fucking liar again. Well, that's, the things that you know, the, the sorry, the things that the sheriff's department would claim is that, you know, the, the cause of death is ultimately ruled undetermined. Right. But the situation we have here is that the sheriff's department is going to say that she probably succumbed to the elements 
or that she had been bitten by a rattlesnake. They do have rattlesnakes in the area. But let's keep in mind, the state of California only averages two of those deaths a year. So she would be one of two unlucky people to strike the rattlesnake lottery Mm -hmm. and get bit out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Their basic claim is they believe that she took off on her own, on foot. She ended up there. She got distressed. This, This is a hard area to walk in. A hard area to that she succumbed to the elements, and at some point the this is I guess a flash flood zone, and that it may have flooded, and that would be the cause for why because we said her body's naked, the mm-hmm. the remains were naked, so those clothing items that were found, the belt, the jeans, the bra, those items, according to them, would have been removed after she had already passed. So I, I don't, I don't buy that. Of course, nobody, nobody in their right mind would buy that. How, how jeans, jeans, mm-hmm. we're talking about jeans here. They don't just come tight, off of you. Tight jeans. Well, yeah. And mm. so jeans don't just come off of you. And as well as, I mean, maybe a bra, maybe I could, maybe I could, if my mind could wander wild and maybe some animals helped with this and maybe you could say that about the bra, but you can't say mm. that about the jeans you can't say that about the belt. With the belt, it it went through the loops. You know, there's belt loops here. It unbuckled itself and went through the loops, and they're found elsewhere. They're not found, like, right by the body. They're found, right. you know, uh, like 100 feet away or something like that. So here, here's a couple problems we have. The, the other thing is they, they recovered hair, and the body was partially mummified. That means that there's hair on portions of that body as well. Mm-hmm. They failed to comb the hairs of that body to see if they could recover somebody else's hairs. I mean, this is right. Cause just, it could be a mixture. Yeah. This, whether she ended up there on her own and did succumb to the, to the elements, or if she was placed there by somebody else, mm-hmm. regardless, they could not have botched this thing more. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't attempt to screw this thing up more. It, you right. know what I mean? It's, it's, it's horrible. Right. And then that becomes a question. Did they, they botch it because they're, you know, dumbasses, or did they potch it because they they're trying to cover something up? I mean, like, and I just think the whole thing where you go, oh well, there's this flood. That look, we we've seen in cases where people have had manic episodes and hypermanic episodes and all that stuff, uh, some sort of psychosis going on where they start removing layers of clothes. Mm-hmm. So that makes more sense. You know, that she's wandering aimlessly. She's dehydrated. She doesn't know what's going on inside of her own brain. And so she's, she derobes herself. Mm-hmm. That makes way more sense. Right. You know, but they don't even bring that up. It seems like not only are we going to lie to you, but when we do lie to you, we're going to insult your intelligence as well. This is such a Shannon Gilbert type case, isn't it? You know, when you mm-hmm. think about the the clothing found somewhat nearby mm-hmm. the the naked body found out in the middle of nowhere in in harsh conditions you know areas that would be tough to travel on foot um you know they claim with Shan- Shannon Gilbert from the Long Island serial killer case that that she may have shed her own clothes and and kept wandering into the brush yeah um and then she was possibly having then a, a mental breakdown and some sort of psychosis. Here's the other thing, though. I would just like their explanations to make some sense. Like you mm-hmm. said, it would make a lot more sense if she if they would have said she shed her own clothes. There's another thing too. When when a when a body is mummified, mm-hmm. you know it it becomes awfully stiff and it tends to, and it stays in the manner in which it last rests. Well, and this happens normally through extreme heat, they say, right? Yeah, and well, and and it could be because it's partially covered up. Right. But the thing here is, her one of her arms, I believe it was her left arm, was kind of tucked up, almost like a you know how people do the chicken dance, almost like the chicken wing, mm-hmm. but with the with the fist facing outward. So it's it's mummified tight up against her her body. Mm-hmm. So if that brawl came off post mortem, then I don't understand how it gets underneath that arm. Yeah. You know, it, it's just none of this makes any sense. No, and the other thing too is like, okay, so again, um, the the other possibility is she's in this re, um, in this area that she's not familiar with, and this she could have fell, and she would have fell from on top of the ravine that she would pop. You know, they found her body next to a boulder, a mm-hmm. bigger rock. And it's possible that she hit her head. Now, there's no, none of the 
bones that were found and we don't know you know again did the police tamper with what evidence they did find but the bones that they did find um and they found bones multiple times but the bones that they did find there's no trauma right so there's no signs of a bullet know, wound a or, bullet wound or stabbed. being stabbed yeah. or or hit over the head or falling to the death well no but the, but there is a lot of cases that you can get hit in the head and there's no uh, trauma to the bones and stuff, but but there's inner bleeding of the brain. Mm-hmm. So I was talking to a nurse friend about this case. Uh, big shout out to all the nurses. Um, and she said that's a very likelihood. And then if she was going, you know, if she has this brain hemorrhaging, what is her body doing? She might be disrobing because she's hot. She she might not have any clue what she's doing. Mm-hmm. So at least those things make some logical sense. But all this other stuff just. Sounds like a bunch of horse shit. Now, it, I do. We should clear up that they did find most of her remains. They found most of her bones. Um, mm-hmm. There were some bones missing, um, like we said, the neck bones. Um, one of them, you know, when we talked about the Shannon Gilbert case, we talked about the hyoid bone, uh, which which would usually depict somebody being if that's broken. You can usually justify and figure out that that, that means that somebody was strangled to death right. or that their possibly their throat was slit. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. the vertebrae and the neck bones that were missing from her remains would you can't surmise what happened mm-hmm. as far as being strangulation or throat cut. Well, and that that's the that's the other problem here is I mean, you don't have to be some crazy tr- uh true crime junkie to know that. Mm-hmm. And so again, if these cops are on the scene and who were these cops? You know, were they cops that were in, that would have been able to see her that night, that knew her? I mean, like it's just it's a case that you know it's like we have all these questions, and you can't even toss out. You can't even just there's a look. There would be this huge argument that she never, you know, she never left that area, and she she um, she died there by the hands of uh, of a cop, or she died by the hands of some other crazy person or she succumbed to the elements Mm -hmm. or she hit her head. It was accidental or whatever. So that's, that's likely. But on the other hand, you can't roll out that somebody did see her in Vegas. And then, cause the idea is, well, what if she was working for somebody or somebody had her on drugs and got her in the sex working ring and it wasn't working out uh, for him or her or whatever, or this group and then they decided, well, they're still looking for her in that area. Let's kill her and dump her remains there. Mm-hmm. You can't rule that out with 100% certainty. I don't think that's as logical, but you can't rule it out. What do you think Cap- What do you think happened here, Captain? Uh, I don't know. I think, look, people need to do their job. At the end of the day, if you sign up to serve and protect, please serve and protect. Um, the, it, there's some trouble things in this case. I mean, I think they, I think so many times in cases they bring up the race card a little too quick. I mean, their lawyer mentioned, well, if this, if her last name was Spears or Lohan, they would have offered her a ride home. Well, you know, I don't know if that's the case, you know? Uh, I mean, we could argue that people that are, are good looking get advantages, right? You know, yep. there's all these things that we can argue. At the end of the day, I don't think the cops did their job. I think the mental health issue is is one that we're going to be wrestling with for years because the family saw signs of this. You know, the, here's the problem. Just very shortly before she disappeared, though, this right. wasn't didn't seem to be an ongoing thing. Well, here's the issue is like, yes, the the cops did some shitty stuff. They lied about stuff. They should not do that. You were paid by these people. You are paid by the community to serve and protect, not to lie, Mm -hmm. not to try to cover your ass. You know, if you made mistakes, own up to it. Own your own truths. Own your own shit, people, right? This is what they should have done, and and they didn't. And if they would have came forward with this stuff, there wouldn't be as many questions. You know, so do I think they were involved? I don't think so. I I. I, it doesn't make any sense. If they were involved, then wouldn't they just take her away somewhere else to some other part of the country or some other, but she, you know, she leaves, she leaves the jail. And then at some point 
she's trespassing. Are we? And I, I'm I'm pretty sure that that was her. I feel like it's her, and, and I then, t- and I tell you why. Because it seems to me a little improbable that you have somebody matching the description that closely uh, within hours six and within, miles within miles. It just seems too convenient for it to be somebody else. Yeah, unless, again, it's some conspiracy and the guy's just making up the sighting. He's not, I, I don't get that vibe at all. I don't I, get that he's vibe. Retired either. reporter. Uh, the, the thing here is, though, you say they. And I don't know that it needs to be the sheriff's department committed this murder. I feel like if, if, if no, no, I think, I don't think it would be, I think if a member of the sheriff's right, department's right, involved, right. it's a member. And here's mm-hmm. the problem. Here's the problem I have with where she's found. Okay. I don't see her, but I don't see her getting to that location on her own. But, but then you argue, you say, but Nick, she just made it six miles to this guy's house in the dark. So, Mm -hmm. so maybe, maybe she did make it on her own, but, but here's the problem. Well, I think the thing is just going on that point real quick. If she was manic, if she was going through some sort of psychosis, we're talking about the, 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 the the human body has way bigger capabilities than we were aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were stone cold sober and not mentally ill, could you do this hike? You'd probably eventually break down and quit. I don't know if I could do the hike now. Right, that's what I'm saying. But, <laughs> but, but in this state, you just keep going. Right. Maybe when you shouldn't, and maybe that caused to some accident hitting her head or dehydration or I, I don't know. Here's the strange thing, though. This that I keep going back to is her remains are found in an area that is known to who. Mm-hmm. It's known to law enforcement and it's known to for b- by drug dealers, right? You know, by, by drug people, cartel, yeah. drug cartel. So who if, if she didn't get there on her own, who put her there? I would have to say it's one or the other. Right. Um, or she was close enough to that area. That's that's another theory that mm-hmm. maybe she had found her way there somehow. And maybe a member or members from the drug cartel had come back to to check on crops or to plant and found her wandering mm. around. Now again, here's where here's where it doesn't make a lot of sense. Is people that so the, the theory online that you see constantly is that she was wandering around, finds this stash of weed, finds this drug cartel, and because because she found this uh, this weed, that they had to kill her. Well, I don't know that they're saying that. I think that this theory is more a little more evil than that, where it's going, oh, we're out in the middle of nowhere and there's this strange young woman out here. Nobody knows that she's here. Nobody knows that I'm here. Yes, like it's just right, a weird right, right. coincidence. Um, they did find uh, in this location, they did find like like wrappers, like like uh, candy bar wrappers and things like that, mm-hmm. um, which may may have been there from before when when they were out planting these crops and setting up the irrigation system for for the weeds. But the other thing that I found strange in this case as well, you know, it, it's all these little things. Her death, her disappearance is extremely mysterious. But then you have all these other tidbits that are weird dealings by the sheriff's department in my mind. They they didn't fully search the car that well. They right. didn't they didn't really they painted over the mural very quickly. Mm. They didn't charge the people that had had destroyed that property. I mean that's tax dollars that it cost to clean that thing up. And and then last but not least, what what do the rangers say that they found when they when they came to inspect that area? They found the hoses from last year's uh, crop. They mm-hmm. founded the PVC pipes from last year's crop. They, they these these candy bar wrappers and fast food wrappers. We don't know if they've been there for over a year. They probably they could have been there for over a year. We don't know why because mm-hmm. we didn't bother to clean any of that crap up when we were here the first time when we saw that a crime had been mm-hmm. committed. I know that they that the sheriff's department and their personnel and their staff is not the not uh, you know landscapers or or America's janitors. But come on, I mean. <laughs> let's put a little more effort into these jobs. Well, and, and one of the things that her, her father talks about is that, you know, one of the easiest ways to get to a, 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 this land would be through like an ATV mm-hmm. that was possible through ATV and this sheriff department, they actually had a search team and, and, and part of their search team was they had ATVs. So, but the theory that I was going with is, yeah, it's probably more sinister than that. 
So she's out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, I'm here. So then they, this guy or people rape her and kill her. And then the other theory is that the sheriffs know about this crop. They know about the gangs, but they are working with them on some level, mm-hmm. you know, like a kickback or we just, we don't mess with you. You don't mess with us. We pretend and, you don't exist. You, right. Yeah. And you give us a little kickback and, and look, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of evidence of cops getting kickbacks in drug areas. Mm-hmm. You know, Hey, this is my corner. I give you a little bit of money. You go away. And now you're not making 70 grand a year. You're making 150 grand a year, mm-hmm. you know? So there are those cases. I, I don't see it being like that. You know, I right. think, I think the mental el- uh, the mental health angle is some that brings up the most questions. What she said to, you know, what she was talking to her parents about didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. What she talked to the valet didn't make any sense at the restaurant. Didn't make any sense. Now, if we go to there, then stop her at the jail and don't release her and have her evaluated. And if they would have done that and put that simple hold, then the parents and the family have an opportunity to try to turn her life around and make it better. I mean, her life wasn't going badly, but whatever was going on in her life, whether it was a drug thing or if it's a mental health thing, maybe they could have got her a little help. If all they had to do was say, hey, you're going to sit here for a while and we're going to have a doctor look at you. Mm -hmm. And I think this country will step up and eventually at some point it'll be like, if there is any mental health concern, you're going to wait. Maybe it's not 72 hours or 48 hours. You know, maybe it's just like we pay tax money for all this stuff. We give all these benefits to prisoners, for example. But what about the what about the citizens? Mm-hmm. What about hey, if somebody gets pulled over and we think they're drunk or they're acting a little weird, we're going to arrest them because we don't want them to hurt themselves. We don't want them to hurt somebody else. But instead of having them be in, being caged for you know twelve hours, twenty four hours, or whatever, six hours, we're going to have somebody on call. And within six hours of you being brought to the station, we're going to have a doctor come in and evaluate you. And if you pass the evaluation, then we'll let you go. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and that's for the safety of the citizens. And we give all these rights to these criminals. Like what, and we give all these benefits and privileges to criminals. When can we start doing that for the community? Right. I, You know what I think happened here, Captain? I'm going to go with... Latisse. I think Latisse is right. That's the mother. That's Matrice's mother. I think I'm going to go with mother's intuition. Mm -hmm. I think the whole time from the very get go, from the time this thing started until they found her remains, her gut feeling was right every single time. And, you know, when, when she was picked up, what did she do? She called the sheriff's department and and asked, are you going to let her go? Because if you are, I'll go and get her. If you're, if you're going to keep her, then I'm going to get her in the morning. She had that. She had that mother's intuition from the beginning that they might let her go. What ends up happening? They let her go. She calls in and wants to call in a missing persons report five hours after my is released from the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. They won't let her, they don't let her file a missing persons report. They don't. She, she, felt in her gut right then that her daughter was missing and within an hour she's by all purposes missing Mm -hmm. when they started and she started saying right right after that first search was conducted and they didn't find anything she started saying you know what my child had a mental break some kind of mental health issue happened she snapped Mm -hmm. she was out wandering around in unfamiliar territory somebody saw her took advantage of the situation picked her up, they killed her, and they dumped her somewhere in some remote location. And right. when the sighting started happening in Las Vegas, even it, even with her ex-husband's sighting, potential sighting, she was saying the entire time, that's not my daughter. I, I just know it. I know that she's she's yeah. not alive and she's not with us anymore and she's out somewhere. She's been placed somewhere. And so I'm going to go with, my theory is that that she didn't end up there on her own. I think that somebody did take advantage of a situation. I do believe it was probably her in that backyard that was spotted early that morning. Mm-hmm. I think she wandered on before sheriff could arrive. Right. I don't know if it was a sheriff that found her or if it was some evil guy or an evil sheriff that found her. 
but I think that somebody picked her up, took advantage of the situation, mm-hmm. and I, I'm going to go with mother's tuition, intuition there that I think Latisse is right. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the two logical things, more logical things, is she either went on some manic rant and then she succumbed to the elements or there was an accident, and then the other is, you know, the whole thing about when people talk about, like with the uh, Mara Murray case, the whole idea that she would be running down this road and just happen upon a killer. Well, yeah, that's that's not super likely. But how long was um, my trees wandering around? Mm-hmm. So the longer you wander around, the more there's opportunity. Mm-hmm. And and not just do you run into a killer, but do you run into a rapist? Mm-hmm. And that rapist then turns into You're a murderer. Exactly right. Yeah. So, and I think, I mean, it's just a super sad case and, and, and it's sad. Um, now we should just say that, you know, there was lawsuits against, um, the sheriff and, and, yeah, and the they, family was awarded like $900,000. Yeah. The, the, the father and the mother who are separated, as we said, filed, uh, separately, they filed lawsuits against the sheriff's department. Uh, they ended up combining those lawsuits, um, and they each had, had their own representation mm-hmm. uh, and they did settle out of court for my understanding was $900,000, which they split four fifty four fifty. No, that's not how they split it because I guarantee you that lawyer that was bringing up this bullshit about Spears and Lohan and he, he, the lawyer is going to get 33 to 40%. Well, yeah, you cut me off before I could finish that. It it clearly says in the settlement, I read the settlement last night. Mm -hmm. It says, I believe in the first page or the second page that, that after the settlement is paid out, everybody will pay their own lawyer fees from that amount. They will, they are responsible for their own, uh, counsel that they sought. Uh, we should also mention that the body was exhumed at the, at the, uh, at the encouragement of the family. Um, and it was also determined basically, even though they examined the body a second time, they pretty much came up with the same situation that cause of death is undetermined. Yeah. And I think unless they find, um, you know, do another search or find more bones that, that there's no way to there. It's not a complete picture for them to be able to come to any conclusion. Mm Mm-hmm. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and man, it's been a long day. Uh, We got a recommended reading. Recommended reading between December 1968 and October 1969, a hooded serial killer named Zodiac terrorized San Francisco, claiming responsibility for 37 murders. He manipulated the media with warnings, dares, and bizarre cryptograms that baffled the FBI code breakers. Uh, check out this book. I highly recommend this one. This is a case that we've been asked to cover quite a bit, so I, I thought I'd recommend a Zodiac book. And this I find to be the best one. Zodiac Unmasked by Robert Graysmith. If anybody's seen the movie The Zodiac, most of that movie was based off of the information found in this book. But oh, there's cool. so much more information here. Uh, and and I bought this one secondhand a few years ago. Uh-huh. And I always find this funny when you buy them at a secondhand store with a big, thick, true crime book. You will find that the center spine is all creased up and nothing else. So somebody bought this true crime book. I see this all the time. And all they do is they look at the pictures in the middle because, <laughs> and then they, then they sell it back to somebody. Uh, but in it, within these pictures, it, there are the Zodiac letters, the famous cryptograms, mm-hmm. all those that you can see for yourself. So pick up this book, Zodiac Unmasked by Robert Graysmith. You can do that by going to truecrimegarage.com. Click on the recommended page. You'll see all of our recommendations there. So, uh, again, like always, go to truecrimegarage.com for everything. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, Instagram, all that stuff, untapped, and at, at True Crime Garage. And, and check out the, uh, I believe, the Slender Man documentary came out on HBO this week. So if you haven't checked that out, I believe it came out on Monday. So check that out. I'm looking forward to doing so. All right. Thanks uh, again for listening. I hope everybody has a great week, a safe week. I hope uh, everybody's commutes a little bit better with the two parters. Hope everybody, your boss is nagging at you and he doesn't know that you're listening to Nick and, and the captain in the garage. Screw him, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. S- stick it to the man by one, by listening to True Crime Garage. And we will see you back here next week in the garage. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't live.
you can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.